thank you so very much. Um, happy Sabbath all. Happy Sabbath. Uh, thank you. I, I was wondering to myself, um, have the Agar family ever sang a song of the family? I, I haven't been in what? At home? Not for us. Uh, I've sitting between his daughter and, and husband and listening to, to him and thinking to myself, Matthew, at least you can play the piano if you don't want to sing. <laughs> Um, it's good to be back. Um, I've, I've, I've traveled quite a bit this summer. Um, I can say I've traveled by land, air, and sea um, all this summer. Um, we have changed our, our house um, to some degree. Uh, I've done a lot of, of work at home. Um, I've had a busy summer, very busy summer, and my school year is ramping up to be the same, um, unfortunately. Um, please pray for me, your man is servant. Serve. I want to remain humble. Um, yesterday I got a I got a, a, a picture from a friend of mine. Most of you know that I've been doing my doctorate at Andrews University, and um, I should have been finished. <laughs> so the picture was of of two of my friends who we started together, and I I kind of took care of them while they were here. One is from England, and the other is from Hawaii. So whenever they would come to to Andrews. I would be the one to, to take them around, I'll take them to the store, I'll take them to get groceries, they could stay by my house, and, and I saw their picture yesterday with their regalia. They're finished. Amen. <laughs> Pray for you, your man, sir. Because this morning I woke up and I was heading out the door, right? And as I walked past a certain area, all of a sudden, zzz, you know, flies. I'm like, what is this? I know that the flies like to come to our front door to get warm in the, in the morning. You know, but it was unusual. And so uh, I went and I started the car, you know, making sure everything was okay. And then I looked back and I realized, some animal had done their stuff right in front of my door. Oh. And the flies were all around. Now, should I, should I just leave it alone and say I'm going to church? Look at me. I look so... I think so. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm a man served. And I said, no, let me get this stuff off um, and make my home a better place. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, school starts this week for me. Uh, you young people, you still have some time off. I wish I were you. Um, the title of my sermon this morning, Hesitation, Resignation, Annihilation. Driving a lot this summer, I was glad that I did not drive through New York. I went through New York um, some time ago. Um, we were going to South Africa, we had to drive through New York. If you have never driven through New York and you're afraid of driving, don't go. <laughs> You've got to be strong of heart to drive through New York. Uh, I got a ticket there once, that's another story. But I, I was driving through it, and if you know the taxi drivers in New York, they don't stop for you. They don't stop for you. I was at one light, and, and of course, there's a lot of cars, yellow cabs, and, and they kept on going and going and going, and I saw the light turn yellow, so I expect that they're going to slow down. No, they didn't slow down. They kept on going. The light turned red, and they kept on going, because there was, was traffic, but they just blocked the entrance. It happened twice. Cars behind me are blowing their horns. I guess they're New Yorkers. Yeah. They understood that if you hesitate, they're going to continue going. Yeah. And then I understand driving here in Chicago and driving in LA and driving in Dallas and some other big cities. Um, when you hesitate, you have the, uh, the, your, your bent is towards um, resigning and saying, okay, whatever, now I'm, I'm not going to do it, you know. Um, and when it comes to the spiritual life, no. We, we cannot hesitate, we cannot resign. Hesitation, resignation, annihilation. Uh, many of you know the story of Lot. That's where we are going to be studying this morning. And I know that you know the end of the story. Everyone talks about the last part. Remember Lot's, remember Lot's wife. So I'm not going to go to the end of the story, but I'm going to talk about the crux of it. Um, 
it's familiar to us, and, and we know that Lot decided, you know, as I look across the expanse of the, the area, um, Abraham has given me the option where to go, and so I'm going to choose that location. Because it looks good. It looks rich. It looks um, luscious. There are good things that I see about that place. So Lot chose that location. Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure when you got there, you realize, just like was spoken of Nazareth, can anything good come out of it? You realize spiritually and morally, it was sparse. There were not many things going on that Lot and his family could connect with. But that's where he chose to live. That's where he chose to raise his children, daughters no less. That's when he chose to make a living. And so this morning we meet Lot at the gates. That's where he's sitting. And now some of you have studied, you know what it means to be sitting at the gates. It's a place of prominence. It's a place of status. Uh, you're good if you could be sitting at the gates. That's a place of governance. But we also realize that, that Lot himself did not hesitate. He wanted that position because he wanted to proudly make himself known to the people. As we continue study, we read from Genesis chapter 19, verse 1. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, verse 2, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. You know, Lot got this from somewhere. And when you read the book of Genesis chapter 18, you see there that Abraham did the same thing with his guests. He invited them to his home. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. Keep your hands in Genesis. 2 Peter chapter 2. Because I want you, as we go through this, to keep this in the back of your mind about this belong. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 7. And it says, And if he rescued Lot, what kind of man? Does your version say? If he rescued Lot, a righteous man? A what? Upright? An upright man. So here in 2 Peter chapter 2, we see that Lot is a righteous man. And that's the thing I realize about biblical characters. God knows their heart. Amen? Amen. And God knows our heart. So even when we do make mistakes, and others around say, how could you stand in front and talk like that? Praise the Lord, God knows my heart. Amen. God calls Lot a righteous man. Now we go back. Lot runs to them, bows before them, and invites them to his home. Invites them to his home. I have a feeling that there, there may be two reasons why, why Lot did that. Again, I mentioned that, that Sodom was a place of, of immorality. Let me just say it. It was a place of immorality. And Lot being the person that sat at the gate, he understood what was going on. You remember Abraham was praying that could they find 50 and 40 and 30? And maybe even 10? Huh. I wonder if Lot was trying to increase the number. And, and, and so Lot was here thinking to himself, you know, this is a place of immorality. And, and here are some new, some new faces to my town. Let me try and, and find out if, if they'll be willing to serve the living God. To serve the living God. I, I think about it this way. If you have someone come to your home, from another country, not America, from another country, and they haven't been exposed to television, our entertainment and things like that, um, would we uh, allow them or, or permit them or, or want them or encourage them to watch some of our television shows? Our television, um, maybe, maybe not. Now, I, I, I think to myself, I met a student in, in Korea while I was there, um, I would want them to, to watch certain programs on, on HBO, MTV, VH1, some of the network TVs. 
It seems as though some of our entertainment, it's, it's more than just the thermometer of our society, but the thermostat of our society. Do you understand the difference? Mm -hmm. The thermometer, it just tells us what it's like, <laughs> what the temperature is, how we feel. The thermostat dictates what the temperature is going to be. This week I, I had an interesting experience. In my prayer time, I was saying, Lord, I know that, and I was always saying it like this, Lord, I know that you are coming soon. If, if in the near future, and I'm thinking a year from now, okay? If in the near future, maybe they, they come out with some program that, that uses the word Satan in their TV show or, or, or hell, and, and, and they make it a bit glorified, you know? Like maybe a TV show that says the cool Satan or the awesome Satan. If I ever see that, I know the Lord is coming real soon. And, and I thought about the word hell as well, you know, um, or, or demons, making it, making it lighthearted. And then this week I saw, I saw a commercial for a new TV show, Angels from Hell. Not more than two days ago I prayed this prayer. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing a program entitled Angels from Hell. Hesitation, resignation, annihilation. Uh, but, but Lot had a, had, a, had a sense of what was going on in his city. And, and so he understood what was the economic situation, the political situation, the religious, societal situation. Uh, do we have that understanding? Uh, are we looking at economically what's going on in our world? We should. Uh, do we see what's happening politically in our country? We should. Uh, do we see what's happening religiously? They tell us that when the Pope was in Ecuador, he had to have the, the, the airport. And that's where he held his mass. Uh, for they believe that almost the entire community around there came out to see the Pope. Well, he's coming in September. E educationally, I wonder to myself if I'm going to need a job. There is a push, 2020. It's called Epic 2020, you can go and read about it. But there's a push so that uh, most students, if not all students, do not have to go to a classroom to be taught by a teacher. Instead, uh, there will be video updates where students can now stay at home. Man, that's a good thing. They'll be safe there. There won't be any bullying there. And they won't have to learn other behaviors from others there. Hmm. I, I wonder, do we know what's happening in our world? Because whoever is in charge of that curriculum is the thermostat. And they are teaching our children whatever they well want. We have to be careful. A lot was sitting at the gates. He knew what was going on. And I wonder if we will understand Revelation 12, 12. And it becomes meaningful to us. When will it become meaningful to us? And this verse struck me. When? Where will we be when Revelation 12, 12 hits us in the face, square in the eyes, and we say, change has to be done. Has somebody found it yet, Revelation 12, 12? Yeah. Yeah. What does it say? Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, have a great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. When will it become real? The devil does not have hesitation, friends. He does not have a pause button. His program is full on green. He may deviate and it may seem as if, oh good, he's backed up. Uh uh. He still desires you. We still have an X on our body. He wants us, but our God is merciful, hallelujah. Amen. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible in this original appears to say that uh, these men that came uh, towards, uh, to Lot's house, because Lot went in, he went in with the, uh, the men and Lot fed him. Remember, there were no microwavables then? Okay, so the meal that was prepared, it probably took some time to prepare the meal, okay? Um, so right before they went to bed, 
the men came to the door. Now, now what men? The Bible tells us it was the old and the young. You dig a little deeper, it's almost all the men. <laughs> no, 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 really. When you dig a little deeper, it, it, it represents the men from every corner, from every strata. It was the intelligent men, it was the political men, it was the poor men, it was the rich men, it was the intelligent men, it was the educated men, the uneducated men, it was the farmer men, it was men. And the Hebrew says, from every corner, Sodom was not a small place. But this is something I've observed about immorality. Hear me now. The longer you stay in it, the more strange things you need to fulfill. And so that's why we can have a lot of people now that, that are doing some ghastly, awful things. They came with one agenda. There are some new people in your house, dear lot. We are, we are we're content with, with all the others, but there are some new people, lot. And and we want them. We want them. The other fact that you need to understand is the timing. Self-control. Where has that gone? Where has that gone? So they came and we are told that it was late in the night. They came banging on Lot's door. Couldn't the guys have waited until morning? Something else about immorality. When a person is burning with passion, it's difficult to quench. And so right then and there, the Bible talks about how they called Lot. They actually shouted, screamed his name, because they really wanted to have their passions quenched. And they were not going to stop until they had that, those men. They were not going to stop. You know, I wonder to myself, why? Why does the Bible say, as it was in the days of Sodom? So shall it be when? Days of the end. Look at this. When I look at the leaders of those that are advocating strongly, or even the, uh, the representation of the LGBT movement, I see that they are politicians, I see that they are athletes, I see that they are musicians, businessmen, and women, professors, teachers, mechanics, hairdressers, Olympic athletes, homemakers, they come from all walks of, all walks of life. I also realize, number one, there is no shame. There is no shame. They're, they're coming out and according to the angels, the angels said in, in Genesis 19, we want to stay in the square. <laughs> Maybe this, these individuals today, they're coming out into the open square as well. But there is no shame. There is no shame. It, it was well established in Sodom, that's who we are. And now it's becoming well established today, that's how we live. There is no shame. So you better recognize us, leave us alone, and let us do whatever we want you to do. Second thing, there was no restraint. No restraint. And, and I may step on my toe, but I have preached about this before at other locations. I do have some concerns about some of the entertainment that comes out of Disney, those cartoons and stuff. You see, um, when I listened to that song, and I was going to have Leah pull it up for me, but she moved. All right. When I listened to that song, and I, I read the words, and please, don't take my word for it, go home and read it yourself. Frozen. Let it go, let it go. What's the next part? I can't hold it back anymore. No restraint. Now, we as adults, no, we don't sing the song, we don't sit down. But the little kids, they sing it all the time. That's how we get to know it. Because the, there it go, there it go, I get it. You know? But the little kids are being, I'm being honest, they are being indoctrinated. They are being programmed. So by the time they become, mm, let's say, nine years old, they desire to have their sex changed. Nine? Nine. 
they desire to make the, my wife gave me the word, transformation, transition. They desire to make the transition at nine years of age. So, hesitation, resignation, annihilation. We don't want to get there. No shame, no restraint. And verse 6 and 7 tells us something else. Verse 6 and 7, Genesis chapter 19, verses 6 and 7. And I read for you, Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Lot was trying to reason with them. Trying to reason with them. Uh, but we have a problem. You see, as I've done some, I, I love science. I almost became a doctor, well, went into medicine, right? But well, my brother became a doctor. So I said, forget But I love science. And I did this research about the brain. Some of you may understand the brain. Right here is called the frontal lobe. What happens here? The reason? Yeah, thinking processes. It happens here. At the back of the brain, it's called the rep. Reptil Where's reptilian cortex? Is that back? Yeah, it's at the back. Okay? And they, they believe that evolution says they believe we started with something back here and then we evolved to the front. The reptilian part of our brain deals with what? Do you remember? So what is it? Okay, the reptilian brain deals with um, emotions and in, in, instincts. So if you slap me, what am I going to do? Slap you back. If you cuss me out, what am I going to do? If I like this girl, what am I going to go do? Right? Instinct. Think about the reptiles. Reptilian. Think about the reptiles. How do they live their lives? And I put this into the context of the people of Lot. They weren't going based on reason, they were going based on feeling and how they wanted to live their lives. I feel that we're getting closer to that. Self-control, where is it? And let me just speak to, to all of us, not to just a certain group, but to all of us. I know now we are seeing on the news that a lot of people are getting in trouble with the cops. But hear me, just because a cop has a camera, don't incite him. Amen. Don't egg him on. Don't try to push his buttons to see how far he will get. Because yes, he may get jail, but you may get the grave. Do you understand? Self-control. Let's not go based on how we feel. Well, he did, well, she, mm -mm. Let the Lord lead us. Let the Holy Spirit come upon us. The last thing I want to point out, no shame, no restraint, no reasoning, and then verse 7, it's a hard one, sorry, verse 8, and it says, look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man, let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them, but don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. As I was preparing this, I thought to myself, uh, maybe next time I come, I might be doing a series on the family, using the story of Lot, if I'm invited back. <laughs> but think about it. What was his objective? It seems as though protecting these men is more important than protecting his family, his daughters. Wow. Can we be so busy doing the work of the Lord that we forget the Lord of the work and what he's given us as our responsibility? But it's not a family sermon. But here's it. Verse 8 says, no substitute. These men were not having any substitutes. We don't want your girls. We want those guys. No reason, no shame, no substitute, no restraint. But then verse 9 tells us something. Get out of our way, they replied. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing the pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. I say praise the Lord that Lot was standing up. 
I say praise the Lord that Lot was standing up. Now, I don't like him offering his, his children. But, but I say praise the Lord. Church, let's look at ourselves. Are we standing up? <coughs> at school, are we standing up? Even at our Christian school, are we standing up? At our jobs, are we standing? Do people, like was said this morning in Sabbath school, uh, can people see and hear that we are children of God? Are we standing up for the Lord? He was trying his best, but he was not standing in the Lord. Hence we get to verse 10. Verse 10. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Uh, I want us to compare verse 10 and verse 6. Verse 10 and verse 6. Look at it very carefully. Verse 6, it says that Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door. Verse 10, who shut the door? The angels did. Verse 6 tells us, verse 6 and 7, Lot went outside and he tried to reason with them. He tried to uh, coerce them. He tried to bribe them. Was he successful? No. The Bible says they're about to break down the door. We're going between verses 6 and 10. Genesis 19. Yes. Yes. Now, what happens in verse 10? Are the people able to break down the door? No, they're not. God will protect his people in the last days. Amen. He will protect his people. But we've got to stand for him. For the scriptures say, if we do not stand for the Lord, he's not going to go to the Father and stand for us. It is clear. But I must hasten on. I, I really do. Um, you know, it's hard for some of you to, to stand and proclaim the love of God or uh, speak about Christ. For me, as a pastor and a teacher, it's a little easier. I have a captive audience, such as you are today. But that's, that's not the only avenue I have to, to speak to people. I really would encourage you, this week, ask the Lord to show you who you can impress upon His love for them. There is no time to hesitate in the change that needs to be made. That is the crux of my sermon this morning. Lot did not hesitate to invite the men to his house. Lot did not hesitate to make a meal for them. Lot did not hesitate to go out the door. Lot did not hesitate to offer his daughters. But Lot did hesitate. Let's jump now to verse 15. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry up, take your wife and your two daughters, who are here, or you will be swept away when punishment comes to this city. It's not easy to take care of your house during a storm. And it's not easy to get right in the last days. The time to do so is it's now. My father and I were extending his bedroom and a hurricane was coming. He thought he had more time. He did not. So, the rain started to come down, the wind started to blow, and he realized that uh, the roof is not fully covered. So where do we have to go? Back up. So we went back up. He and I went onto the roof in the pelting rain to cover the roof with a tarp. While he was up there, he slipped and fell off the roof. We are extending the bedroom, remember? So we have to put footings. If you know Caribbean work, there's always rebar sticking up. And yes, he gashed his knee against it. It's not easy. It's not easy. While the storm is coming to prepare. And that's why we read about the, the ten virgins. They did not have the extra oil. Now is the time for us to get the oil. Don't hesitate. And then we get to the word resignation. I've done it. In school, I'm studying for something, and I realize, man, 
it's too late. Look at the time. I, I'm not going to be able to pass this test anyway. So I resigned to not study at all. And eventually I failed the test. Maybe you're driving I-55, 294, 88. You're driving to work and, and, and you want to get in. But you see cars, and you think to myself, OK, um, you know what? I think I'll just stay here. I'll just stay behind this, this truck. We, we know exactly what it's like to, to resign. And oftentimes we resign because we think it's too difficult. We resign because uh, we think that it's not going to work. But I'm here to tell you this morning, friends, don't give up. Don't give up when the way is hard. Don't give up when that child is out there. Don't give up when the marriage is, is, is training. Don't give up. Don't resign on what God can do in our lives. Don't give up. I know that some of us have gone through difficult times, even, yes, being estranged from our families. Just like, like, like he was, Lot. You realize that he went out to get his sons, yes? He went out to get his sons-in-law and said, guys, this, this the city is going to be destroyed. Let's go. And what does the Bible say they did? The Bible says they laughed at him. They mocked him. They didn't believe what he was saying. And I fear, I pray, that our friends, our family members do not identify with them. Where we come and we speak to them about the soon return of Jesus. And they say, like they said in 2 Peter chapter 3, you know, you've been talking about it for so long. So long. And the Bible says that, that people in the last days will mock the same way they mocked no. But the Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. But we have to be consistent, amen? In what we say and how we live. They mocked Him. And so he came back home, not dated, and sure, he felt depressed. His friends, the people he was sitting at the gates were with, were outside the door, and they were not wanting to hear his plea. His sons-in-law, they were not wanting to hear his plea. Who would hear Lot's plea? And the Bible tells us that Lot hesitated. Is your life so that when the Lord says to you now, it's time to go, that you are ready? Or have we hesitated so long that we've decided to resign and we have not prepared? I'm here today to say, stop wasting time. The final events will be what? Rapid. Rapid ones. We will not have time to prepare during the storm. Friends, let's hasten to be consistent in our lives. Let's hasten to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's hasten to change whatever it is that the Lord is telling us to change. And here I want to take off my shoes. And students of mine know that whenever I say I'm going to take off my shoes, it's because I, I may come across strong. I want to turn to patriarchs and prophets. In reading from the chapter on Sodom, because she says something very, very important. Patriarchs and prophets. You who are slighted, the offers of mercy, think of the long array of figures accumulating against you in the books of heaven. For there is a record kept of the impieties of nations, of families, of individuals. God may bear long while the account goes on and calls to repentance and offers of pardon may be given. Yet a time will come when the account will be full, when the soul's decision has been made, when by his own choice man's destiny has been fixed. Then the signal will be given for judgment to be executed. And then she says, There is cause for alarm in the condition of the religious world today. God's mercy has been trifled with. The multitudes make void the law of Jehovah, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Infidelity prevails in many of the churches in our land, not, fidelity, not infidelity in the broadest sense, 
an open denial of the Bible, but an infidelity that is robed in the garb of Christianity. While it is undermining faith in the Bible as a revelation from God, fervent devotion and vital piety have given place to hollow formula formalism. As a result, apostasy and sensualism prevail. Christ declared, as it was in the days of Lot, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. The daily record of passing events testifies to the fulfillment of his words. The world is fast becoming ripe for destruction. Soon the judgments of God are to be poured out and sin and sinners are to be consumed. Hmm. Before the destruction of Sodom, God sent a message to Lot and he's sending a message to us today. Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. The same voice of warning was heard by the disciples of Christ before the destruction of Jerusalem. When ye shall see Jerusalem come past with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them who are in Judea flee to the mountains. I'm not here today to tell you to flee to the Rockies or to the Appalachian, but, but I am concerned that in our hearts we are still connected to earth. We are still connected to earth. And when, not if, friends, when the Lord comes, he will come back for people whose hearts are with him in heaven. Where are our hearts? The second passage I want to read comes from the great controversy. What happens? Because Christ had foretold that there will be a destruction, and he had given them warnings to do what? To flee. And whoever fled, they were saved. For seven years, a man continued to go up. This is from great controversy. Go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, declaring the woes that were to come upon the city. A voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and against the temple, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, a voice against the whole people. This strange being was imprisoned and scourged, but no complaint escaped his lips. To insult and abuse, he answered only, Woe, woe to Jerusalem. Woe, woe to the inhabitants thereof. His warning cry ceased not until he was slain in the siege he had foretold. And if you have not read about the siege of Jerusalem, I would encourage you from the great controversy to do so. I just want to read this portion. After the Romans under Cestus had surrounded the city, they unexpectedly abandoned the siege when everything seemed favorable for an immediate attack. The besieged, despairing of successful resistance, were at the point of surrender when the Roman general withdrew his forces without the least apparent reason. But God's merciful providence was directing events for the good of his people. The promised sign had been given to the waiting Christians, and now an opportunity was offered for all who would to obey the Savior's warnings. Events were, to, to, were so overruled that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the flight of the Christians. Upon the retreat of Cestus, the Jews, sallying from Jerusalem, pursued after his retiring army. And while both forces were thus fully engaged, the Christians had an opportunity to leave the city. I end there. Because after they left, guess what happened? Romans came back. And at that point, all who stayed, all who remained, history tells us that there was blood running down the steps. It was so far. What are we going to do today, right now, if the Lord is impressing upon you something in your life, something you need to stop, something you need to start, hesitation may lead to resignation and eventually annihilation. That's not what the Lord wants for us. I believe the entire family would have been lost. Lot's entire family would have been lost if Jesus had not stepped in, if the angels had not grabbed on to his hand. You know, Jesus was not going to grab on to everybody all the time. He does it when 
when we sincerely with our hearts plead out to him. But there are some people who will simply resign and say it's too hard to live this Christian life. It's too hard to change. It's too hard to read the Bible. It's too hard to get up early in the morning. It's too hard to do this. It's too hard to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. But let's focus on, on that word. Verse 60, hesitate. It means to debate with oneself. And that's what Lot did. And I have a few stories from the Bible. Eve, did she debate with herself? Yeah. And, and who else? Cain, did, did he debate with himself? Uh, the Antediluvians, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 95, tells us that some were willing to go. They were willing to go. But having talked with others, they got discouraged. Friends, let's not debate with ourselves. Let's trust in the word of God and move when he calls us to. Ben Franklin once said, you may delay, but time will not. <laughs> and I say, we may delay, but the end is coming. Revelation chapter 22, and I close. Revelation chapter 22. Beginning in verse 6. And it reads, the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angels to show his servants the things that must surely. Another version says, soon. Another version says, quickly take place. Verse 7 says, Behold, I am coming how? Ah, blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in his book. And then we go to verse 12. Behold, I am coming how? Verse 17 says, The spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free, the gift of the water of life. And then verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, I, somebody finish it. Hesitation. We have no time to hesitate. This week, if the Lord convicts somebody to change something in their lives, do not hesitate, do not resign, but press forward. Amen.